Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest is once again George Ledge Jr. here to talk about Easy Company 506 Parachute Infantry, the uh, illustrious band of brothers. George, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Ben. I'm really excited to have you here. We're going to talk about some aspects of Easy Company that never made it into the book, never made it into the, the miniseries. You got some really cool artifacts to share with us today. I'm excited. I'm wearing my Curahi shirt today in honor of Easy Company. All right. <laughs> I want to give the uh, the makers of this shirt a company called Civi Supply a quick shout out. They don't uh, sponsor the show. There, there's no uh, you know financial incentive for me to do it, but it's a quality shirt. It's a quality company. It was founded by four brothers who are veterans of the United States military. They got a great love for our country. They got a great love for the military. I believe at least one of them is still serving. Uh, their website's civisupply.com with two V's. Go check them out. I, I highly, highly urge you to. Uh, so with with that introduction uh, out of the way, George, uh, what we were talking about before the recording is the guys in Easy Company, just like the you know 16 million or so Americans who served and, and their countless millions of allies, they were together for years. I mean, the guys in Easy Company were together for for three, three and a half years getting ready for the uh, the invasion of Europe. And only so much material can make it into Ambrose's book. Only so much material can make it into a 10 episode uh, miniseries, six episode miniseries. I, I apologize to the diehard fans. I can't remember precisely how many episodes. I think it's 10. But anyway, the uh, you have so much stuff that your dad left in the form of letters, recollections, recordings from reunions. And, and we wanted to share some of that today. And one of the things I was really interested in learning about was your dad appears from the, the archival records that you have to have had a closer relationship with Webster than appears in either the book or in uh, the miniseries. So if we could, I'd like to kind of explore Webster a little bit, share some of his writings that, that you have in uh, letters to your dad and things like that. And then we can just kind of explore that aspect of the company that didn't, didn't really make it into Ambrose's book or make it into the miniseries. Well, thanks, Ben. You're right. Uh, you know, Webster was an interesting character. You know, he was the Harvard kid. So everybody was kind of taking shots at him for that. And uh, but he was a amazing writer and he was able to capture a lot of stuff that came in his book. And also his wife, Barbara, had sent me and other kids uh, some of the some of his writing. So it's really neat to go back and look at what he wrote and uh, to see the relationship that he had with, with my father, uh, which is quite humorous. So there's this one, there's this one segment there. It kind of was in the series, um, but it didn't make it, uh, it was, they touched on it in the series, but it didn't make it in the series. Unfortunately, I, I read about it in a book and then there's this other little excerpt here that I could share and they were in Hagenau and uh, they were talking about this building that had to be blasted, if you remember, in episode seven, or I think it was seven. Uh, no, eight. I think it was eight. And they talked about my dad was flipping candy bars out. And uh, one of the guys, Cobb, was railing on my dad saying, hey, what are you going to do? You're going to save these for your rear restaurant. And then he said, he dropped the <laughs> uh, and then And then I think my dad was just had, had enough listening to these guys. And he flipped a box to... Uh, uh, Webster and said, hey, Webster, we got to go take care of this building. So this is in reference to that. And uh, so the, the, the title of it is The Undesirable Neighbor. So they're in Hagenau. And, uh, you know, they got, you know, OP1, OP2, OP3, and then they got company headquarters and all that stuff. So, so this is Webster from their disheveled, very unattractive house on the bank of the Swollen Creek. Um, so we're here today in, in, a, in, in my, uh, in my undisheveled, my disheveled basement, <laughs> uh, homage to that. So anyway, so it goes on, it says clearly visible from our cellar window and a hundred yards away in the enemy territory stood a silent, presumably unoccupied house. Thinking that nobody lived there, we raised and lowered our blackout boards every night, morning without even thinking about it. After several days, however, we became aware of a peculiar phenomenon. 
in the German dwelling. His shutters in that basement remained open all day, but at twilight they were closed silently by some mysterious force. And in the morning, they would be reopened again. Hmm. We had neighbors. This was an awkward and potentially embarrassing situation, for if we could see the change in their blackout, then they surely could see the change in ours. We decided to remedy it immediately, since the house was too close to our lines for indirect mortar fire or artillery fire, we called for a bazooka on the double. The company comedian, a blithy Portuguese named Luz, was then playing bazooka man, trotted down from company headquarters, ran out from behind a post opposite the enemy house and laughing and shouting, three shots round into the basement, stimulating the occupants and permanently opening the shutters. <laughs> from then on, however, we kept our blackout boards up so that the Germans would think our home was abandoned. After all, among neighbors, one discourtesy invites another. We did not want to invite a Fauster, Panzer Faust in return. So, so anyway, so that was my dad. And reading that, reading that in um, Webster's book, he gets a little bit more descriptive, but I think you really kind of get a flavor for uh, for for what happened that particular that particular day or that morning. The, the thing I love about that is how lighthearted it is because you, you you get a sense from watching the miniseries you know and and you can just think about how even though they were out of the battle of the bulge they were past foy it was still cold it was still combat they're literally living in a cellar and it's you know it's still combat conditions but the lighthearted aspects that webster brings to that just kind of gives you a sense of <clears throat> the uh, the morale and the attitude that these guys brought to their conditions, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, because they had been through so much. And uh, yeah, so at this particular point, you know, they were just saying, you know, I, I, I think I can make it, but golly, let's hope I can. Yeah. So, this, and if you if you pulled somebody out of their comfortable home in Texas, where I am, Rhode Island, where you are, and put them in the middle of that situation, they would have been like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Whereas that was actually pretty good living for those guys by this point. They're, they got a roof over their head. Uh, they're, they're worried about a couple of Panzerfaust shots, but they're not they don't have, you know, 88s raining down on them constantly. Yeah. So it's, it's actually an improvement to what they've been dealing with for the past few months. Oh, sure. You know, when we had talked about the last time when they're, you know, being in Bastogne and being in foxholes and being really cold. And uh, yeah, so this is certainly a step up in this dusty <laughs> devil basement, similar to where I'm standing right now. No, I th so that, that story actually made it into Webster's book, Parachute Infantry, correct? Correct, yeah, I did. It's a bit more descriptive in there. And um, so, uh, but anyway, yeah, I got a huge kick out of reading that. And, and Barbara Webster, Webster uh, Webster's wife, I don't want to say first wife, but Webster's wife uh, started coming to the reunions and it was really neat to meet her. And then so she shared all this other stuff that a lot of us hadn't seen. And actually, you know, the book came out in 94. But um, so, uh, but yeah, it was really great to, to meet Barbara several times over the years and correspond with her and her husband, Charles. Charles was a great guy too. And in a, in a touching sort of way, I remember you know, not that I was any closer to uh, Barbara than anybody else, but I do remember that when Barbara did pass away, uh, Charles had sent me a private note. In the mail. Oh, wow. And, uh, so it was kind of, it was kind of neat to get that. That's amazing. Now you got a couple other stories I want to share, because I want to revisit the fact that, you know, Webster was a writer, he wrote several things, but you got a really neat story about your dad at the end of the war that I was hoping you could share with us right now. Yeah, yeah, this one's a ride. You know, I never really knew this one until after the war and uh, of all people told me it was Garnier and you know Garnier was already gone by then but you know this was just one of those kind of crazy stories you know and typically my dad was involved in so but anyway so this one is about Birch's Garden and it says I found Birch's Garden a nice place uh, a nice place to visit during our stay me and two buddies absconded with the Volkswagen command car I turned the keys on and wouldn't start, picked up the hood and shouted, no motor. 
So we thought a little bit, looked in the trunk and bingo, there it was. So, so off we went. First trip, treasure hunting. Second trip was to Hitler's house. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't home. So we helped ourselves to champagne about 40 bottles. Webster said, cheap bastard, it's only 1939 version, vintage. Three days later, two fellas from another battalion needed a ride about 20 miles outside of Birchescott. When we arrived in the area, waiting for us was an MP. His first words were, park the vehicle over there. After a verbal confrontation, I went back to the car, opened the trunk, and put eight armor-piercing rounds through the motor. <laughs> I can't tell you what he said. Not having transportation, I got a ride to Strasbourg. From there, I started to walk down the highway. Lo and behold, coming down the road was a German soldier on a motorcycle. With an empty gun, I commandeered the cycle. Only problem, I had never driven one before. <laughs> Not surprising. After 15 to 20 minutes, I was on my way. About five, mil about five miles from Birch's Garden, Two German girls yelled, and for one minute, I took my eyes off the road and bang, into the bridge. <laughs> I laid there for a while and finally picked, it was finally picked up by guess who? The MPs. They had taken me to a German hospital, and the irony was the date. May 6th, 1945, the war was over. <laughs> so, That's you know, he conceivably could have got killed. Exactly. Oh, you know. <laughs> anyway, and that just reminds me of that. You know, training for war is a dangerous occupation. Obviously, combat's dangerous, but young paratroopers can be a tremendous danger to themselves, even when they're left to their own devices. And that mm. just really, you know, especially mixing you know champagne with motorcycles and uh, <laughs> man cars, you know, and firearms. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm so yeah. glad your dad made it through the war relatively unscathed after all those misadventures. <laughs> well, yeah, because I've got, you know, I've got his record. So, you know, he had several things that, several things where he got injured or, and that, you know, certain things were, were, you know, army related where you got a purple heart for, and then other things were just, you know, this was pretty much self-inflicted. So, you know, I, I'm actually, I know about self-inflicted. I've done, I've done th things like that. Not to that degree, but I've done things stupidly. <laughs> we can do a whole other show on it. There's an old saying about apples and trees, I think, that probably applies here. No. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. My wife tells me that all the time. <laughs> you, know? Look, you have one other really cool thing that we had talked about, and this comes back to, to Webster more directly. He left a record of his assessment of the non-commissioned leadership of the company. And does this appear in his book as well? I don't, I don't know if it does or not, but you know, I found this, this came out of, this came out of the, from the wartime diary of David Kenyon Webster. So yeah, you're right. It kind of leads up and it talks about the non-coms. So it goes like this. Um, these were army non-coms. Their average age was 21. They were not the hard boiled sergeants pictured in all the civilian cartoons, but just good men holding their jobs by ability and popularity. Although they could give the commands for close order drill in the non nomen nomenclature and functioning of the M1 rifle, they were not tied up in the book that ruled the lives of so many army non-coms. They didn't hold themselves aloof from the men in any way, cadre. They didn't hold themselves aloof from the men in any of our cadre that did our basic training but mingled with the rest of the platoons on equal terms. In the old army, where sometimes you had to serve 10 years before you could become a squad leader, Muck, Dukeman, Randleman, and Christensen, and others would have been considered green kids, raw recruits. Hell, they didn't even know about the articles of war. They didn't know enough to salute the colors when on case before a parade. They hadn't served in Panama, Hawaii, the Philippines. What kind of soldiers did they think they were? They were the new army, civilian soldiers. They did the fighting, they died. They were the ones who saved America. 
And, uh, you know, I just, I'm just, when I read that the first time, I just said, man, that's really a really great assessment of the non-coms. Not only in e-company, but in, in all, you know, you served in the military, so you know the non-coms are really the ones that keep this all together. Oh, definitely, definitely. That get it done. And I think that what's amazing about that is it, it just lays out the fact that these were guys who, you know, you, you get the slang term, oh, they're out earning their stripes. They literally earned their stripes through being, you know, willing to step up and bear that burden. They, you know, in early 1941, they hadn't been in the military. By 1944, you know, they're parachuting into France, you know, you know, leading men, and they do that job well. And it's just, it's, you know, a, a testament to the character that these guys had. And, you know, truly deserving of those positions, not because of seniority or longevity, but because they stood out as leaders and were willing to, to shoulder that responsibility. I think that's just a, a, an amazing testament to, to them. So we've had some great examples of, of Webster's writing. And he, uh, you know, as you indicated, Harvard educated, and he actually became a writer after the war. That was how he made his living. And interestingly mm -hmm. enough, that's how he, he passed away relatively early. He was still a relatively young man, much younger than I am right now. And while he was uh, researching a book, and it's uh, a lot of folks probably know that from reading the postscript of Band of Brothers, but it's a pretty interesting story. And you've got a little more detail about that if you're willing to share it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. In, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1956, the reunion, the division reunion, was in uh, Los Angeles. So there's this famous picture that maybe you can show of Webster at Webster's family. And I think my dad was the third guy up and my mom was, was sprinkled in that picture as well. And Webster was close to the door. And uh, so that was in 1956. And interesting enough, that was like six weeks after I was born you know, my mom and dad, it was very important for them to go to the reunions, no matter how old their youngest kid was. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that was in a late summer, I think it was. And so Webster sent my dad um, this letter in uh, uh, March 22nd, 1957. <clears throat> J. George, right now I'm trying to sell a nonfiction book about the war. Don't expect very much, though. I got some fine photographs and wrote it up as best I could. There hasn't been a good honest book about the paratroopers yet. I hope this is it. The market for such a story is nil, however, so I'm not counting too hard. No more war stories for me. I've tried far too long and too often to ever try that again. And because um, you know, you gotta think about it. That was in 57, so the Korean War was coming to a close as well. Well, had that already closed, not- It wrapped up about, you know, four years earlier, but still it was fresh in people's memory. Heck, World War II was still fresh in people's memory. You know, you had a, such a large portion of the population that it served. Yeah, and it probably was kind of a fatigue for war at that point. You know, I, I don't know, did everybody want to move on or something like, you know, well, at that particular 57? Yeah, you know? I would certainly think so. Because, um, you know, I remember like George Koskamanke, he came out with some great books. I'm not sure exactly when his first book, but he was a great writer as well. And, um, and then in doing the, some research, you know, I found the, uh, this, the Coast Guard report. And it says in 1961, Webster was lost at sea off the coast of Santa Monica, California, between September 9th and September 12th, while doing research for a book called Myth and Maneaters. The United States Coast Guard investigation concluded that it is reasonable to assume that he met his demise during the dive due to interference with one or more of the sharks. That book was published in 1962 by W.W. W. Norton. And with the help of Stephen Ambrose, this book, Parachute Infantry, was published in 1994. So finally got out, his story got out. It's probably been continuous publication since then, I would imagine. I mean, I, I, I just recently bought a copy of it off of Amazon almost 30 years after it was published in 94, so. Anybody that's read his, anybody that's read what he's written says, man, that guy was a great writer. And I don't know, what did he write for the Saturday Evening Post as well? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, so he was pretty amazing. And that, 
And so, you know, that book is still still in publication. I'm sure most of our listeners have read Parachute Infantry by Webster, but if not, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it pretty much anywhere uh, books are sold online because with the popularity of not only the miniseries, but Ambrose's book, uh, the market's gone from nil in 1957 to almost insatiable in, uh, in the 21st century. So uh, Webster yeah. definitely has a, uh, a, a uh, posthumous niche as a, a World War II writer, absolutely no doubt. Well, you know, a funny thing also, within that letter he had sent my dad, there's a part in it, and I didn't include it, but he, he made these, these airborne plates. They were blue and, you know, they were like a dinner plate. But he had made a whole bunch of them. And he sent my dad, you know, I don't know, a, a box of them. And he said, hey, just sell these things for two or three bucks. You know, uh, you know, sell them for whatever you want to sell them for. And just said, you know, send me, you know, 10 bucks and we'll, we'll square. So anyway, I guess it turned out to be kind of a flop, he said, because nobody wanted to buy these airborne plates. <laughs> and uh, I, I think if you, you know, I think, I think Chris Langlois had mentioned, I don't know if he had picked one up one time, but you know, we, we have the one, I mean, my sister and I, or I have it upstairs, the picture, the plate itself. So it's in kind of a place of honor there. And I try to make sure I don't touch it or move it or break it or anything like that. Because I don't think there's too many of those plates around, but it's kind of a neat little story related to something that Webster do that he thought would be kind of cool. No, it, it certainly is cool. And I imagine that, you know, now that you collectors probably already know that, that, that that's out there, but now that you've got this on, on YouTube, <laughs> You're going to be getting some offers, probably. <laughs> well, I was, I was thinking about talking to Sotheby's, and maybe they, get, <laughs> you know, and say, "Hey, you know, well, it's, it's, good, it's going to be my ticket to getting out of the basement." <laughs> Sometimes I think that it, it's a shame that your dad actually never uh, wrote a book. I mean, there's so many great memoirs that came out of Easy Company, and um, you know, we had Marcus Brotherton on the show earlier. He was talking about doing Shifty's uh, memoirs. We've had, you know. Mary Malarkey on doing the project about her dad. And there's just so many great, uh, great memories that came out of uh, the company. But your dad has left what I think is a remarkable audio record that you're lucky enough to have. We, we've play, played clips of him describing his, uh, his time with Easy Company on the show before, but you've got a really neat one uh, about him jumping into Normandy that he shared, I guess, at a reunion or some kind of speaking tour. If you, if you could kind of set that up for us, and then we can play it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that um, that was at the book opening in 1992. And um, what he did was he's describing his little slice of time in preparation, getting on the plane, and everything that he experienced along the way in that little block of how, however long it was, you know, from getting on the plane to jumping out of the plane. So, uh, and it is, there's a bit of... Uh, there's a bit of humor in there. Well, there's always a bit of humor in everything. I, I find every military guy that tells a story, there's always a bit of humor in so many, so many of them. But so there's a bit of humor in this one as well. All right, let's check that out. Look at me with a leg pack that weighed about 150 pounds. I lost mine too. Well, anyway, uh, number 18 man gets in first, 17, 16. And Lieutenant Wells was left behind me. And it took two guys from the Air Corps to pick me up into that plane. Before I go on, he mentioned a guy named Cop. George. Yeah. What's that again? Cop. Look at me anymore, you're not behind me. <laughs> We're all lined up. And I'm fifth man in the stick. Fifth. I said to Lieutenant Welch, I'll never make the door. He said, well, change with Cop. You just heard what happened to the cop. <laughs> he got shot in the room. He got trapped in the room. Yeah, that was a riot there. When you when you looked at the interaction between between Winters and my dad at that, that little interruption there. So I just I get such a big kick out of that. But uh, you know the one of the interesting things with that is for the folks that did see the series in episode four when they had the replacements all sitting there. And uh, I think it was Miller. Cobb was railing at Miller because he had that presidential unit citation. Right. Uh, and uh, about jumping into D-Day and and uh, Randleman came over to Cobb and said, hey, Cobb, you remember you didn't jump into Normandy either. I don't know if he said either and either, 
but um, and that was why he didn't jump in it was because, you know, Welch had switched him with my dad. And uh, so, you know, my dad could have been the guy that got shot in the rump, but it ended up being, it ended up being Cobb. So. And, and just as a quick aside, I found the way the miniseries uh, portrayed Cobb was really interesting. He, he, there was such a dichotomy about his character. You know, he, he stepped up and did what had, he had to do, but he was far more uh, aggressive off the line than he was on the line. And I don't know if that was you know, truly his personality or if that was Hollywood trying to kind of create a, a, a two-dimensional character to contrast with other members of the company who uh, they might have wanted to have their virtues stand out more. Uh, I, I don't know if that was ever anything that came up in at reunions or from stories from your dad, but Cobb seemed to be a very hard bitten, uh, unhappy person in how he was portrayed in the miniseries. And That's a very good assessment. That's a very good assessment of that. And it's probably a little bit of both as far as that goes. And, and you're right. For me, the series uh, brought more questions to me than answers. Because I knew uh, a lot of the stuff that was uh, in the book and in the series, and then, but I, you know, I really would have loved to have been able to ask my dad a, a heck of a lot more than I did as a kid. Um, you know, as, would Cobb, uh, you know, Sobel, and uh, you know, I think we talked about uh, one other time we talked about Sobel and his son Michael, who had come to a reunion in in um, Phoenix in 2003. It was very interesting, Michael Sobel. He came to the reunion. Uh, we all got a chance to meet with him, and he told us a side of his father that we had never heard before. So, uh, so it was pretty good. And and you're right, Hollywood does take some liberties, and I think it's necessary to to tell a story. Uh, and certainly, and that really does show the distinction between a story and real life, because it's a uh, one thing I've noticed about anything. I mean, my my background is military, as you indicated earlier, and it's always easy to watch a show and be like, oh, that guy made a bad decision or, oh, that guy's not, you know, not stepping up. But in situations that seem so clear cut, there's always a myriad of things going on in, in reality that make a leader second guess themselves or have to push through their doubts. And that takes a a level of character that can be very hard to maintain. Uh, most of us, I think, can can step up in one or two big moments in our lifetime, but over a sustained period, like Easy Company faced from June 44 through May 45, you, it takes a really strong person for that level of resolve to, uh, to continue and to be able to refresh that. Uh, so we, I, I tend to look at Sobel in a more sympathetic light because even though the the men thought the guy was an SOB, but I really think it was a guy who was really trying to do what he thought was right and he thought was best in a very difficult situation in which he was probably out of his depth even before they left the United States. And he was just trying to do the right thing. Uh, just went about it the wrong way. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And, um, you know, there was, they were that the strength was there because of what he put them through. No, yeah. certainly. Certainly. And then, you know, some of the some of the liberties that, uh, you know, they take in, in either writing a book or not as much writing a book, but in the series, I think Shifty put it perfectly. He said, well, George, that happened, but it just may not have happened that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a fantastic way to sum up this entire episode. I, George, always a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate you sharing these stories. Uh, and just to kind of wrap it up, I love your shirt. You, you were telling me a little bit about it earlier. Can you share with the audience the significance of this one? Oh, okay, yeah. So this shirt here is the real McCoy. And this shirt came from the set. Um, Joe Hobbs had given me this shirt. We had gone to uh, the set to see the filming. And uh, anybody who sees this shirt always says, gee whiz, I'd, I'd love to get that shirt. Let me show you the back. I don't know if you can see the back. Uh, awesome, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's it's the it was made by the real McCoy. It was a limited edition, and uh, I'm I'm privileged to have one because of my buddy Joe Hobbs. And occasionally we'll we'll see one on, and somebody say, "Hey, where did you get that shirt?" And it's like, "Well, hey, my buddy Hobbs gave it to me." <laughs> That's fantastic, <laughs> George. Once again, thanks for coming on the show, sharing part of your Saturday with us. Uh, I look forward to having you back again sometime soon. All right. Hey, thanks so much, Ben. It's been great. <laughs>